first things first, but not necessarily in that order. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host McGee Dam, and today we're going to be talking about Megloss, uh, written by John Flanagan and Andrew McCullum. Uh, it is directed by Terence Dugley and it is just, and it's a four part adventure uh, and it is the second story in the John Nathan Turner era of the show that brung a lot of changes onto it and it has the, the, the same atmosphere that has been continuing on from The Leisure's Hive. Now this is the Ultimate Doctor Who Collection DVD. Uh, yeah, I don't own this one on its actual, um, its main to entertain one. And if you want to look at that, that's that. But um, you might notice something strange about this particular one, um, which has been bugged me. I don't know why it's bugged me, but it just has. Uh, if you look on the box, Adric is there. Adric is not in this story. He doesn't appear until the next the next story. So um, there's a bit of an issue on this DVD cover. I don't know why he's there. Why did they decide to do that? And these DVDs are actually made by Two Entertain. So it's strange how a company known for um, for the high quality has made such a giant goof. Maybe they just weren't a fan of this story and thought because it's in that season. Um, uh, he, he's probably in it. Who knows? Um, but anyway, um, this story sees Tom Baker not only play our hero, the Doctor, in this, but also gets to play the villain, Megloss, a plant creature that um, takes over the... It's really confusing. It takes over the body of a humanoid, um, who I don't think we ever get the name of, and when it takes it over its body, it can transform into the Doctor, and it seems to have some sort of evil benevolence. Um, but yeah, now this story is paced very strangely. Um, in terms of the Doctor and Romana and K9, their actions don't actually, they don't actually get involved in the story until part three. Um, in part one they get stuck in a time loop um, because Megloss um, is, has got a plan. Um, basically what's happening is that um, Underneath, um, underneath this planet, there's a. Uh, these are two kind of religious people. One is like more scientific, and one's more like believing gods of tie and stuff. One of the uh, the leader of this um, of this religious group is actually played by Jacqueline Hill, who uh, huge Doctor Who nerds like myself would remember playing Barbara. The first Doctor, one of the first Doctor's first companions, which is really cool. But seeing her in this role um, is kind of distracting because we, because we, she's a huge part of Doctor Who and she plays a completely different character. And they never bring up, they never even mention that, um, like any sort of resemblance to Barbara. It's very strange, but she does a fantastic job here, and um, she basically plays a leader. Um, who gets not angry with everybody because they don't respect their religious views. Um, but anyway, this uh, and these two groups of people, they get their power source from um, this device. I can't remember what it's called. The Hex, the Hydro, the Hydrogonic, yeah, sorry. It's like something like the Hydrogonic Gone or something like that. Um, this like device that powers up their their cities and stuff, and um, uh, the more scientific group want to experiment on it and stuff, but this religious group don't uh, don't want anyone near it, and believe it's like a power source from the the god um, Tai, um, and so, but something's gone wrong, and uh, some of the energy is depleted, so they ask for help, and they ask for the doctor, and now the doctor gets. Uh, no, sorry, the Doctor sends a message over to them and just by coincidence, so they, they're like, Doctor, come over, we need your help. Um, and so the Doctor then um, is set on a course to, to this planet. However, um, on the surface on this planet, which is now just a desert, um, there's these pirate-like uh, group. I can't remember what they're called. Um, but anyway... 
they they've kidnapped this human person because they've got information that this creature called Megloss wants him for some sort of malevolent purposes. And so they take him and um, Megloss's real form is a cactus. Now, I really like this story and I really... Um, and Megloss is a really great villain. But the fact he starts off as a cactus makes it really hard to take him seriously. Luckily, the story does a fantastic job at making him much more threatening when he's not a cactus. Um, the voice given to him is just fantastic. And then just the idea of him controlling people and when uh, the connection is not like 100%, like their skin has like all like cacti stuff all over it and it's really eerie. And so he takes over the body of this humanoid and he promises the pirate people that he will get them um, one of the most greatest power sources in the universe. Um, and so he, he uses his computer and discovers about this message that's been sent to the Doctor. And he traps the Doctor in a time loop. Now the rest of, season, of episode one, the rest of episode one sees is just the Doctor and Romana uh, getting stuck in a time loop. Um, well, that and half of episode two. And it's just them constantly um, reenacting the same scenes so and they keep using the same shot which is kind of a bit cheap, but it helps with the rest of the story. This story isn't afraid to take its time. It's a bit more slow paced for most uh, people, but it does a great job at setting up this world and this atmosphere and the mythology of these people. And so it is actually pretty well paced for the most half. However, when the Doctor and Roman escape the the time loop they then land on the jungle part of this planet and so they um and uh, the doctor gets sent in because but before that megloth actually arrives before the doctor disguised as the doctor and he actually takes their power the the power source and when the doctor arrives uh, megloth is actually escaping and they mistake the doctor for megloth and so they capture the Doctor and sentence him to death. Um, whilst this goes on, however, Romana gets separated to them and she gets um, um, captured by the pirate people and she has like her own little adventure with her and with K-9. Now, um, I really like the stuff with the Doctor in this story. Um, it always feels like the villain is one step ahead of them and because of this um, confusion you too generally are like how the hell the doctor's going to get out of this one everybody has not only believed that he's the villain but they've seen him with their own eyes how will the doctor uh, talk himself out to this one of course he does um, but in the in when you're in the moment it, it works very well however I think the problem here is uh, when Romana gets separated the the rest of her plot is just her trying to confuse the pirates until she can catch up with the rest of the story. And I think that could have easily been uh, cut. Those scenes just seem to be wasting time and for some comedic effects, um, which does help lighten the mood. I mean, um, there are some really dark moments in here. There's a bit where um, it's revealed that the humanoid person inside still is like conscious. And um, Megloss is just walking around and suddenly um, the humanoid creature kind of like pokes out and Megloss pushes him back. Basically, the human character is like in a world of torture and it's really, it works really well. And there's a great scene in which Megloss um, captures, uh, she, he forces one of the women to work for him and uh, Tom Baker just nails it on the acting. So let's talk about the directing. Uh, Terence Dugsley is a wow this story feels like it should be put on a cinema it's one of the few i think it's the only story in the classic era that uses a specific um, um effect which allows not only to have um some pretty decent green screen i mean for now it has um aged poorly but i think for 1981 it looks really good um and it only really suffers a bit when you see Tom Baker in his burgundy costume and his boots with a little bit of green on it do kind of fade away. 
But for everyone, all, all the other characters, it does a fantastic job. And not only do they interact with uh, some of the bits, for example, um, in these green screen, they use it for the outside of Megalos's uh, building in the desert. And there's these like giant panels and the characters walk in front of them and behind them with the green screen. And uh, that's impressive enough. But the fact that like in the panel there's a curve and you can see their feet walking off just it just looks really high budget um, from 1981. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, but also with these green screen effects, the camera moves uh, from left to right. And when you see the um, the long shots when the characters are like shortened and it, the camera pans to look at the from the ship to the um, to Megalos's like base, uh, it just it really feels like you should be watching this in the cinema. It, it does give that almost Star Wars -y, um presence to the story. There's also a, some really great set work um, because in certain scenes you can actually, there's actually like a really well um, designed moon or is it another planet in the sky and the camera actually zooms out of it to reveal the rest of the, rest of the set. <clears throat> and you really genuinely feel like this could be on location and that could have actually been a planet. It does a very fantastic job. Um, I mean, I can't stress enough how well this story uh, looks. It might struggle a bit when it goes into the underneath of the city. Um, the jungle looks good, but we've seen better jungles in classic Doctor Who, especially in episodes like um, Creatures from the Pit, The Planet of Evil, um, Dalek, uh, just a bunch of stories set in the jungle. It's not particularly memorable in terms of other Doctor Who stories with jungles. And um, there's a few sets inside the the culture, the, the two cultures building. It doesn't particularly look outstanding, but the camera angles, the, just the movement of the cameras, there's some scenes where Characters will be coming towards the camera, coming out of the corridor, and the camera pans back. Um, and just, yeah, just there's a lot of great just camera angles, and I highly um, just appreciate, um, what's his name again? Terence Dugley's directed in this. Go watch it for that, for that alone. And obviously Tom Baker's um, Meg Loss. Now, let's talk about uh, The Doctor. Uh, like I said in the previous story, Tom Baker seems to have railed his, his um, crazy, um, out-of-control doctor a bit. He's reeled him in a bit. He's a bit more calm, relaxed, and um, calm-headed. There's some bit um, science stuff that uh, he says that they don't really make much sense. Like when they get stuck in the time loop, um, the solution is just to reenact their all their stuff before they do it basically setting it out of loop and uh, breaking it, which I don't think really works. But um, Tom Baker does a great job at explaining it and stuff. Um, the, but when he gets involved with the rest of the characters, he does uh, do a very good job at bringing out his Tom Bakery, just not as much as before. Now, when he plays Meglos, the villain of the, the piece, um, some bits are really generally... You could, Tom Baker, he kind of plays it like himself still. Um, there's especially a bit when, after he's gotten the device, he's back in the ship and he tells them, it's like, this thing will be, will make it worth your while. Um, but the way he says it and the way he smiles seems a bit like uh, the Doctor. But there's also some really great moments in which he's almost robotic, almost lifeless. Um, when he just stands there, he's just staring out. Which is something the Doctor does a few times, but here there's something a bit menacing about it. And it really does strike as um, as a dark in, uh, interpretation of the Doctor. Um, and, yeah, uh, so, yeah, the story doesn't really pick up until halfway into, like, part two. And the Doctor doesn't really get involved until part three. Um, the Doctor is... Um, taken to be part of the problem and so 
he gets sacrificed. Uh, well, he is set up to be sacrificed, which is our, one of our cliffhangers. Um, but the soon they realise that there are two doctors running around, and uh, Romana and one of the civilians actually goes and stops uh, the doctor's death before anything can happen. And so when they realise, right, the doctor's the good guy, they actually let the doctor go to try and... Um, with two other citizens of the characters. Um, who I don't think had much in terms of personality. I can't remember the names. They're just character A and character B. Should we just call them? Um, and so they actually go to Megalos's place. Only for... To them to really not, not do anything. Uh, the Doctor goes in and we learn that um, this thing that Megalos has got um the power source um his his building can actually turn it into a massive weapon which can destroy any planet in seconds and um the doctor runs uh to goes into it pretends to be megloss um in a typical double ganger fashion where you get like the mix-up and stuff and the Doctor goes in and sets it up so it actually destroys itself. And with these pirates now being a bit power mad, they actually kidnap um, Megloss and the Doctor as well. Because they don't, they meet them at different points and put them in the same prison. Which is the only time I think the only, the only time really the Doctor and Megloss meets. But I love the Doctor's reaction when he looks at him and he's like, Have I seen you before? That is just a great Tom Baker moment. Um, and then Romana, K9, and um, Citizen A and Citizen B go searching for the Doctor, only just... And they open the door, basically, and um, let Megloss there die whilst they run um, out into the TARDIS. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's really how it ends. Um, so there you go, that's Megloss. Uh, overall, there are some genuine stuff to love about this story. Um, Tom, Tom, Tom Baker um, playing the villain. Um, usually two Tom Bakers. What's not to love about that? The strange pacing of um, the story being more on the civilians and the actual Doctor and Romana. Uh, Doctor and Romana kind of feel like side characters in this. As, like I said, they don't even get involved in the plot until part until like halfway part two. I don't really have anything to contribute until halfway into part three. Um, and yeah, but there are some issues um, in here. For starters, mainly most of the side characters are a bit boring. Romana and K9 get the weekend of the bucket um, on this. Uh, fun fact, one of the pirate, the pirate captain in the story said he would only play that role if he gets to kick the K9 prop. That's the only reason why he took up the role. That is just, I love that. That's just really, uh, really cool. Um, but the music is fantastic. The, the directing is fantastic. Megloss is a great villain. Tom Baker is pedantic as always. And there are some really great character beats. Um, and it's weird seeing Jacqueline Hill as playing a different character, though it is important to mention that she gets killed off in part three or four, sorry, at the start of part four, and it's really, really weird. Like, she gets, kill, she gets killed by saving Romana and shooting a gun, and that entire scene could have been cut, and he wouldn't lose anything, and literally the doc doctor and Romana go up to her body, and it's like she's dead, but we can't do anything about it, so come on, let's go. Why kill her off? That was just a really pointless scene. Um, but yeah, so Meg Gloss, really good, um, a really good story, really creepy, has some great atmospheric moments. Um, and just remember, he's not the Doctor. He is Meg <laughs> So there you go. So join me next time where we start off the key... No, sorry. So join me next time where we will kick off the E-Space Trilogy and we will say hello to a new friend of the Doctor. So join me next time for the Full Circle. See you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!